ladies and gentlemen, we are gathered here today in the house of our Lord. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to uh, have my first time as a preacher in a church. A wonderful <laughs> venue, wonderful backdrop. I hope I don't get too religious on you all. I'm known to be a little bit irreligious, a little bit uh, irreverent, definitely not irrelevant. Um, some people have been calling me controversial at the moment, and I'm like, and you say that as if that's a bad thing? I don't get it. You know, we live in this, uh, you know, world where, uh, you know, truth is throttled and where um, authenticity is often um, manufactured. So, you know, I think what I'm going to be trying to do here in this talk is really share some techniques that I have developed over the last two and a half decades working with the plant entheogens. As they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So I've basically developed some techniques that will help people to come in greater contact with themselves and to clear anything away that is preventing that contact from occurring uh, with themselves. So this is not a talk about psychedelics, but in the spirit of this conference, it's about essentially being in the body. You know, I think many of us might have come across the the uh, Indian perspective, which is, you know, the idea is to sort of raise your consciousness uh, through the chakras and, uh, you know, somehow ascend. You know, we have this sort of idea of ascension. And I think Mario's idea for this conference is about embodiment and about coming into the body, about descending rather than ascending. So um, I've had a, quite an interesting journey as a human being. When I was 16, I began to spiritually awaken, I suppose, and really, I did really go out of my mind and kind of go mad as well. And I think the society that I, I grew up in, uh, rural North East Victoria, was rather narrow-minded and uh, parochial and colonial and... Uh, I basically rebelled against that paradigm, but also perhaps I saw too much that I wasn't quite ready to handle, uh, apparently, and uh, I experienced a kind of a disconnect from myself and all reality, which is, I can probably talk for hours about that, but that's, this is not about me. So in my life, I think I've been at attempting or endeavouring to come into an awareness of those techniques and understandings to bring about connection. And to be honest, there's not that much that I found that really worked. You know, I suppose to me, what really worked were the plant psychoactives and I found that through working with them, I could really clear a lot of baggage and, uh, you know, mental, emotional, psychic noise, you know, internal inconsistencies, you know, and come into a greater alignment, alignment with myself. And I suppose when I was really going hard with that from about 2000 to 2002, I take psychedelics two or three days a week and I was really going out of my mind, you know, and I was really, you know, pushing the boundary and I don't necessarily recommend that to everyone. But after that time, I was being quite crazy for a couple of years, basically pretty much living homeless, not in a really slummy way, but, you know, what didn't have a permanent. I found myself quite sane and I think... You know, I think the psychedelics, they might have a reputation for bringing craziness, but 
often they're really just bringing our craziness to the surface, our inconsistencies, our wounds, our um, disjointedness, disalignment, disconnection, uh, you know, our, our epigenetics, you know, etc., etc., etc. So, yeah, one of the first techniques that I found was when I began taking MDMA in the early noughties. And some of you who might have taken MDMA might have noticed that when you do, your jaw starts shaking. And it's uh, quite pronounced. And what I found is that I would take other phenethylamines, not just MDMA, but research chemicals that were um, developed by Alexander Shulgin, like I'd take DOI, DOC, 2CB, uh, you know, I take mescaline as well. And I found when I take, took those phenethylamines, I could really let go of my jaw. And it, the process started to happen that I'd lie in a hammock and I would be letting my jaw go and shake and it would vibrate. And I would feel this immense sense of relaxation, of uh, calmness, of letting go. So this, this became, in a way, a kind of a spiritual practice for me. So I would do it at all times, especially, you know, when I'm in a sort of peak state, I would be, let, or have, we, have, we, have a, we have someone who is highly amused by this, is like, you do it too, don't you? <laughs> um, and I would, I, would, I would spend hours doing this. And I would find this immense warmth and this immense afterglow. Uh, I'd find even more benefit in doing this than taking psychedelics. And after like a few years of doing it, I found that what seemed to be happening is I seemed to be releasing this deep fear and contraction within my body. And I could even feel parts of my body whereby there would be, a re- I'd feel parts of my body release. It might be in the left side of my stomach, it might be in my heart chakra, it might be in my, less so in the limbs, I'd find it generally in the torso, less so in the head, it might be in my throat. And I would have this general sense of uh, release and, and relief. But the thing about it is, um, it seemed to me that, there was so much of this material, whatever it was, uh, you know, fear, call it fear, call it contraction. I wouldn't call it trauma. It almost seemed deeply with, embedded within, within the, the human organism. And I, I expect there's not too many people who've taken this up as a spiritual practice, apart from me. Um, I was <laughs> recently... <laughs> Um, talking to a friend who used to take MDMA and she said that she would do that and call it peaking and what I call it is a featuring and I didn't give it the name featuring it's a friend of mine uh, Brice Jansbergen who called it I think he called it that in about 209 something like that so I've been doing it for thereabouts I don't know, six years or something, and I didn't give it a name. And he was like, you're doing this thing all the time. And so he's like, gave it a name. So that's the name that stuck. And uh, since then, I've been sharing this with people, especially in the MDMA space. And what I find is that doing this, you can, it's not just allowing the let go of the jaw. It's, It's about letting go of the psyche. It's about uh, relinquishing control in the mind. It's about, you know, this. most people have a lot of tension in the jaw. They're actually holding um, a lot of tension. And a lot of people find it very difficult to let go of their jaw. They're holding on so much. There's so much that's not spoken about that they're holding back in particular. But I find when I'm doing this, my jaw, it vibrates in an inconsistent, unpredictable pattern. 
like a song that's continuous. And um, I can't say I've entirely figured it out, though I am observing. What I find very interesting is, is if I'm watching someone do it, I will feel a distinct relaxation in their presence. I will feel distinctly like, wow, you really... And when people do it, they will often feel it and they might do it for 30 seconds and they'll be like, oh, wow, that feels really good. You know, but they won't necessarily take it up as a spiritual practice. You know, as I think you've got to feel the benefit of it and understand the significance of what it can lead to. I was doing an MDMA therapy session the other day and uh, a woman, I was teaching her this, and when she was able to release the jaw and do it, that happened for maybe um, 30 seconds, a minute. But then her whole body started shaking because it's very much connected. The jaw's connected with the body. There's a lot of talk about trauma release happening through shaking. But what about the jaw? What about our capacity to create language and the world? It's actually very much more related to the head space. But then when you're doing it, it's connected to the somatic space as well. And I'd say from doing this, I've found, I wouldn't necessarily call it peace, but I'd call it like, coming into like a deeper contact with myself and having a deeper fearlessness in my life, not, not being, generally not being motivated by fear, you know, generally being, you know, I think that my general approach in life is kamikaze, you know. I don't have any fear of what people think. That is my superpower. I'm sure that pisses a lot of people off endlessly. I don't care. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think my general countenance, if I look at pictures of myself from even 10 years, 15 years ago, I think I was a lot more stodgy, a lot more kind of like lumpen. I was a lot more kind of like, you know, sort of in my head. And as I did this, I found that I've come more into contact with the, you know, the the somatic contact of my body. And so when I, I will often lie down in the middle of the day and fetch, maybe for five minutes. And I might, recently I've been feeling a release in this energy centre. Does anyone know what this energy centre is called? Does anyone have any, like, this is often called the high heart, it's often called the soul seat. It's actually, you know, people, different people, um, call it a different energy centre. It seems to be quite a significant one right here. Um, so recently I've been feeling a release there. It's, it, it's actually quite this palpable uh, energetic sense. And I feel like a lot of this is very much related to coming out of the head and coming more into contact with the soul. You know, I grew up, uh, as a lot of us did, in one of the most spiritually impoverished countries in the world, you know, this colonial consciousness which really denigrates honesty, denigrates emotion, you know, it's very heady, Anglo, par angular, cunty, mean paradigm which doesn't really value and honour the human being and the human being's value and emotional expression. So I think in that par that paradigm almost rewards you, you know, for being in the head, you know. But I think as an organism, we're actually empowered in a real sense by being interconnected with our head and our body. And I'll talk about that later on. How the, um, you know, some I've got some lots of heretical ideas to share with you all, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, so I think this, this is something that I think will catch on some point because I've seen the power of it 
in my own life and it also very much relates to what Willem Wright called the essential nature of the orgasm, which is actually a vibratory uh, contraction. And uh, that is, I will definitely um, talk more um, about Willem Wright. Uh, who, I'm going to do what Tamara has been doing. Who's heard of Willem Wright? Can you put your hand up? One. Okay. So Willem Reich was a contemporary of Freud and uh, uh, Freud saw about uh, maybe 10 patients, a dozen patients in his life, whereas Reich worked at the mental hospital and he started realising that he could help people by giving them body work and that he could... So he was really, this is in the, you know, uh, uh, you know Vienna in the 1920s, 1930s, so he, he came to the same conclusion that, that Freud did, that sexual oppression was really the, 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 um, the, the main problem that afflicted people. But he had, a, he had a different view to Wright in that rather than talking to people, he'd do body work with people. And he would, he would see that people had this armour in their body, that, a defensive armour, and he was able to give people body work and do this de-armouring, release their defences so that they were more vulnerable and open to experiencing life. And so it's said that Reich, um, especially towards the end of his life, when he was very much more adept at this, uh, after working with someone for 10 minutes, he was able to bring anyone into an orgasmic state of bliss. And Reich's uh, understanding, he had quite a few patients, and he would, uh, he would work on them and bring them back to what he considered to be a, a balanced, sane, you know, sensitive, um, uh, emotional, aware human being, rather than an emotionally repressed, neurotic, you know, um, person who lives in their head. And what he found was that the people that he treated who became well truly weren't able to live in Western civilization. They had to go live in a cabin in the woods because they were just too sensitive and aware and didn't want to live in the world. So his conclusion was that the world was sick, the world was wrong, and the world was dysfunctional. And so Reich was eventually put in prison, all his books burned, uh, all his devices burned. He's quite an eccentric character. And, uh, you know, since then, and I think in general, most people say it's generally not a good idea to say the world is wrong, the world is dysfunctional, it's more, you know, it's more convenient, you're going to get less pushback from the world if you, like, yeah, world, you can be, you can be the best you you can be, you know, it's this, um, <laughs> you know, this more kind of, like, Ascending from where we are now rather than, you know, deep investigation and inquiry into our relationship to a paradigm that is very much dysfunctional and then, you know, doing that deep work. You know, it's not just self-work, it's actually calibrating ourselves, at, you know, essentially coming into a sense of, okay, what is true health? What is... Um, you know, what is our capacity for beingness? And we can get that with psychedelics, of course, have these peak experiences and then, you know, have this experience of, you know, how we could possibly be, what we can possibly experience, you know. So there's a very good Wikipedia article about Willem Reich. It's one of the best Wikipedia articles ever written. Um, and I'm going to talk about his students. Willem Reich only had two students. One of them was Alexander Lowen and the other one was John Pyrrhus. And they both had quite a strong influence on culture. Uh, I highly recommend everyone watch the four-hour documentary called Century of the Self, which is how the world has chosen a worldview based on Freud which is neurotic, suppressed, controlling, 
and seeing that there's a dark instinct, a, a dark a darkness within humanity that must be repressed. And it talks about Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, who is the father of public relations, i.e. mind control, i.e. You know, controlling the public. And then it counterpoints that perspective with Willem Wright's perspective, which is, no, there's not darkness in the human being. The human being is actually a wonderful animal, you know. It's, a, it's about liberating the human being, about letting the human being be free in an energetic sense, in a sexual sense, in a relational sense, in a, in a feeling sense, that, no, this is the, the world has chosen to go with Freud. And almost nobody knows the work of Rilla Mike, and not many people know the work of John Pirikos and Alexander Lowen. So Alexander Lowen developed a kind of bodywork called bioenergetics that some of you might have heard of. And more of you might have heard of TRE, trauma release exercises, which largely came from bioenergetics. So Alexander Lowen would put people in these positions, these stress positions, and they would be, uh, being in this position, they would be forced to come into their contact with the earth and themselves. And they would have this, I've done these exercises, anyone can do them, they're quite easily found. A lot of them are TRE exercises, which you'll find more YouTube videos about. Um, and then you'll find, you do these exercises, your legs will start shaking, you'll have this flow up and down your legs, you'll have this movement and momentum of energy. So it's quite profound bioenergetic. So it's all about essentially what we're talking about, coming into the body and realising that there's energetic blocks in the body that we can, um, we can remove by doing some of these exercises you know, like for example, if I, you know, bend over the couch backwards and then Vidor, if someone's got a block here, you can release a block and free up energy in, that might be holding, say, in the solar plexus, right? So, very interesting stuff. And then the other uh, student of Reich was John Pirikos. And John Pirikos, he, uh, he mapped the human energy field. He was one of the first people in, I think, starting in the 60s and the 70s who mapped and saw the chakra system. And a lot of people these days, and even still, I think, see the chakra system as a kind of theoretical, you know, framework that, you know, people of, of a mystical ilk might believe that it's kind of this symbolic perspective where someone like John Pirikos would say he developed his you know, say his third eye vision, and he could see that the chakras were not sort of these wheels, that they were spinning vortices, and that they were at these nerve points, the solar plexus, the heart chakra, the, uh, the throat, third eye, and then there's a vortice up the top, and then there's a vortice going down here, and then there's a vortice in the back. So the chakras have a vortice in the, in the back as well. And again, it's quite a Reichian perspective, but he would, he would use uh, Willem Reich's character structure, and Willem Reich was a pioneer of character structure, which is essentially one of the foundational diagnostic terminologies even used in DSM, I think it's like six. You know, they talk about masochistic, psychopathic, you know, schizoid, etc. That was Willem Reich who came up with those. So, John Pirikos, uh, he actually yeah, mapped the chakras and then, uh, you know, attempted to... Uh, what he saw was that some character structures had, you know, more uh, a tendency of some chakras to be open than others, like some of the rear chakras would be closed, and, you know, he would use various healing techniques to, you know, open people's chakras. So this is, this is in a... In a kind of secular sort of you know not not particularly sort of crystal waving sort of new age aesthetic he's just someone who came to this and uh, so it is very interesting and then John Pirikos he had a student called Barbara Brennan 
and uh, Barbara Ann Brennan, and she taught, well, she learned how to do spiritual healing. She had a lot of teachers, and John Pierikos was one of her teachers. And she released two books, one of them, Hands of Light, in 1988, and the other one, uh, Light Emerging, in 1993. So I came across her book, uh, Light Emerging, in uh, 1993, and I was absolutely shocked. I think a lot of people who've come across these books are just stunned. You know, I remember way back in 1999 when I was, you know, a gangly 24-year-old doing, you know, DNA repatterning workshops with all these late, you know, women in their 40s in Pirate Bay. They kind of mentioned this book and kind of would be like, whoa, man, you know, it's like, what do you say? Like, those books are so startling. I think... You know, it's not like we live in a world which is even caught up with Willem Reich's perspective, let alone Barbara and Brennan's perspective, I think. Uh, you know, it's like almost nobody reads Willem Reich, um, whereas Barbara and Brennan, more people do, but I think the significance of her findings, for me, the last century was Albert Einstein, Willem Reich, Barbara and Brennan. These are the most, I, I'm sure... 500 years, people are going to go back and go, they were the key figures in this time who progressed humanity the most. And, you know, it's often the way that, you know, people who are ahead of their time, time has to catch up to them and understand how, how you know, true that they were, how onto what they were. So Barbara Ann Brennan's discovery, she kind of took it further and mapped the chakras and she also mapped the Hara, and the Hara uh, is, uh, some of you might have come across the Tandien in martial arts, it's like a, a centre, it's a vital centre, they in the martial arts when they're, you know, doing a chop, and they go, Wah! like that's the sound, that's, that's the Hara, right, and uh, you know, there's a very good book, uh, I think it's Peter Durkheim wrote, um, called Hara, and there's not, you won't find that many books on it, but the idea of the Hara is in, entrenched within Eastern religion. In Japan, it's all, you know, China, it's all part of the language of, you know, like the word chi, for example. Um, so it's part of their cultural understanding that they have an understanding that the Hara is almost like a fundamental center to, to exist from, which gives, which has a sense of personal power and personal alignment. So Barbara and Brennan, she mapped the Hara as a line that connected us to the earth and that there was a line that goes down into the earth and there's a line that goes up into the infinite and to the earth. And that there's another, that there's a Tandien and there's another point she called the soul seat, which is this point here I was talking about. So that's pretty interesting enough. And then she talked about a deeper layer of the individual, which was the core essence, which is the unique individual nature, energetic nature of the individual. But I think the main interesting thing that Barbara and Brennan mapped was the energetic dimensions of relationship between human beings. And that's what I found very triggering <laughs> when I was 18, I first came across these books. You might have seen them, they're quite big folio books of colored illustrations. And what she describes is that the primary way that human beings connect is through this, the sacral chakra and the solar plexus chakra. And that there are energetic cords. She, I think, I don't think it's a very good term. She called bioplasmic streamers, right? Not sure if that's ever going to take off, or maybe they need some abbreviated name, right? So I have to say, I've never met anyone who uses this terminology. I've seen maybe six healers who've trained at the Barbara and Brennan School and had life-changing experiences with one of them in particular, and two really. Um, and if you ever get a chance and you find a good spiritual healer, like it's, it can be quite profound. They can do some quite deep work with you. But they would never talk about this. And they said, when they, one of them said to me, 
when they did the training, it's not something they ever covered because this is, in a sense, her perceptions. It's outside of the purview of traditional spiritual healing, say. But I think her paradigm also was very much influenced by John Pyrrhokos' uh, wife. I think Eva Pyrrhokos, her name is. She wrote a book called The Pathwork, which is a very interesting uh, channel book about relationship and, and about how relationship is a fundamental way for human beings to realise themselves. And so Barbara Ann Brennan's idea of how she saw human imbalance and the human dysfunction on the auric level was the ability or non-ability for human beings to connect with each other, not just the openness or closedness of the chakras. So she went into that in quite some detail and it's absolutely fascinating stuff and I'm just surprised that we live in a world where more people are not onto this and, and taking it somewhere because it is so interesting and I think so spot on, but it's like Willem Reich was so spot on too. When you're at the cutting edge of truth, it's confronting. And I think Barbara Ann Brennan, probably her error, is she didn't do what Willem Reich did. She did it. She went from a more psychological model, like, this is what like a normal auric field looks like, you know, and all the chakras are open and, you know, and it's like, Later, she wrote a book and she's like, well, there's no such thing, you know, <laughs> it's like a myth. It's like, like Gabo Marte, it's a myth of normal. It's like this, you know, you read these psychological books that have the idea of the normal person, you know, the healthy person. There's no such thing, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, so, and she, re she released another book called, I think it's called Light Healing, I can't remember exactly, because the first two books, yeah, she did talk about elements of the supernatural. She talked about archetypal beings. She talks about, you know, hell realms and this sort of, but she skirts over it. And it was actually a, um, uh, in an article in New Age Journal I read way back when, where she said there's many things that she didn't want to talk about because she didn't want to scare people, you know? And then later on, in a recent book called Our Healing, she goes more deeper into her understanding of, you know, the, 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 the phenomena of malevolent forces and realms of being and the more difficult, challenging material. She kind of like spilled the beans because I think from her perspective, she wanted to, you know, train people as a spiritual healer and be taken seriously. She didn't want to be judged or castigated by society. So, related to um, Barbara Ann Brennan, so her, her work, I think, profoundly stimulated me and I really took on board this understanding and, you know, I think I felt myself, especially, you know, in the early noughties, I felt quite alienated from society and you know, probably less and less uh, to other people. And I was lucky to find a really good group of friends in the early noughties and, you know, find a somewhat decent community in Byron Bay in the early noughties and, and you know, have, 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 have at least a sense of connection to people who resonated with, you know, my thoughts and ideas and I resonated with theirs. So I'm going to get on to the next technique that I'm sharing and I think it probably took a long time to sort of come online this technique I think um, starting in 2004 I was in a five year relationship and I think that in that relationship I was aware of a lack of relationship and connection I was feeling with my partner that definitely increased over the time and I would often we'd often lie together and just in stillness and you know probably she was more zoned out and I was more 
in an awareness of connection and tuning in and feeling myself and my body uh, ability to connect. So I spent a lot of time moving this radio dial away from the head and not into the heart. You know, this is the thing. This is, this is the theology of our time is that it all goes on here, whereas Barbara Brennan says no. It goes on in the solar plexus. It goes on in the, um, in the sacral chakra. But this is where human connection primary, primarily occurs. And again, you'll have people say, oh, you know, they're the lower chakras and, you know, the sacral chakra is the chakra, blah, 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 blah. It's not necessarily the case. I think that's a kind of, that kind of viewpoint is perhaps a remnant of kind of Catholic guilt and shame, you know, that, the, you know, it's like looking down on the chakras. But no, these are the foundational, the foundational um, aspects of being. And I was taking uh, MDMA uh, with my girlfriend. And MDMA is not a particularly sexual compound for me. And I think a lot of people, it's quite hard to be sexual. So what I would find is that we go into this um, very still place of face-to-face holding. And uh, especially with the MDMA, that would be amplified quite a lot. And what... I would find is that what would happen is that we would go into a mutual agony. You go into mutual suffering, like really painful stuff. And normally, most normal people would kind of like, <laughs> like retract, like pain is bad. But this pain didn't feel bad. It felt amazing. And I think, you know, of course... There is, uh, there is definitely a level of suffering, which is the organism realising where it may be out of balance and out of alignment, and it might be in a place which is not connected and aligned with itself. So in this case, I felt that there was a kind of a healing happening. So we go into this agony together, but then after the agony, there'd be waves and we'd go into this ecstasy. You know, we go into this profound connection. And that was obviously energetic in nature. And I think, you know, we live in a time where I think possibly this time in humanity's evolution, say in the Western world, in the, you know, the, the more globalised world, we're at a point where... You know, I think we can wake up to these dimensions of existence and connect them, you know, rather than having this, you know, the head's here and the energetic consciousness is not connected, where we can connect these levels of being and understand and work with it deliberately, rather than it just kind of happening randomly, happenstance, you can actually go into it. So after... Uh, having this experience, we were both like, wow, you know, this is really powerful. So we started, started to do it more. We started to do it more. We took MDMA again. The same thing kind of happened. We had this deeper connection. And then I started to do this with other women. And especially with psychedelics, sometimes MDMA. And I found that, you know, it was... It was actually going into the stillness, being really still, which is with your partner, for a long period of time. Maybe I found about half an hour, be completely still, eyes closed, no eyes open. You can just sit with, if you want to do eye, like eye gazing exercises, sit up and do that for an hour and that's its own thing, right? That's no big deal. If you haven't done that already, Shame on you, right? You should have already done that. What, are, what the hell are you doing here, right? Do that workshop. This is not that workshop, okay? So this is the workshop of the, the sensory deprivation space where we're uh, lying together on the side, front to front, completely still. And the issue is, of course, the dead arm. But you've just got to let your arm die. You just gotta let it go, let it die, pins and needles, it goes blank and you just move on. 
you know, there's even people making these um, mattresses for cuddling, which have a place you can put your arm. I never got one, but it sounds good. And um, so, yeah, in this space, what happens is the mind rebels. Because the mind, you know, the mind, the mind rebels and wants to maintain its control, right? Mind actually starts to get really bored. It, it, it starts to get really touchy and anxious, and all these thoughts come up. You've got to break through that. You've got to break through that. It doesn't take long. It's about half an hour. About half an hour. If you're going to let go of the mind, psychedelics can help do this, especially, then you will, your, your consciousness will move through your mind more to your energy body and more to your holistic energy field because you're, you know, you've got that intent, you've got that awareness, and then you'll start to experience two bodies communicating with each other on that, and you'll experience the cords of energy coming from the bodies and communicating. And, you know, and of course, we're all like, you know, in our day and age, people are hugging and stuff, and you know, I'm very aware, I'm, I'm experiencing all kinds of stuff you know, in that circumstances. And many of you are as well. Maybe you're not able to contextualise it. Maybe you know heaps more than me about how, you know, human beings connect and relate. But there's definitely a connection. And if you create the ceremony for it, if you create the space for it, what you'll find is that two bodies will start balancing and healing themselves. And that you're essentially your core essence will begin to communicate to another person's core essence in that space where you're, you resonate with them and their uniqueness, you will realise who you are and they will realise who they are, you know. And I think this is a profound perspective of spirituality because I think, you know, traditional spiritual roots sort of say, well, you know, you're just going to, you know, ascend and, you know, meet God and that's how you're going to realise yourself. You know, it's that Eastern mystical viewpoint. But, you know, those of us who've, you know, smoked a lot of 5-MeO DMT, you know, it doesn't necessarily work like that. And I think in that still space where you are allowing your energy body to move, that emotion is moving, these cords of energy are connecting and energy is literal energy is moving between you and the other person. And of course, it doesn't necessarily happen right away and everyone's different. And I think for me, it took a very long time, just like I said, to tune out of the head, come into the body, and, you know, you have that. And, of course, some people you don't have much resonance with, you know. Some people are more open on this level than others, of course, you know. Um, and then in that process, you will become more aware of who you are and they will become more aware of they are. And my understanding of what happens then is that that experience can trigger quite profound feelings of ecstasy or bliss or just a very good feeling because the body and the psyche and the soul is really giving you the thumbs up and saying, whatever you're doing here, this is really good. Keep doing it. So it's giving you these sort of rewards within your system. So the entire experience can be quite um, profound. So what I found, and I think this sort of takes me up to, what do we call it? We call them the teens? What do we call them? It's like 10 years ago. Um, What I found, or where this brought me to, was the depth and intensity of the sexual quality between men and women, of course, right? And I think... Within this framework, it's actually sexuality itself, which is not the enemy, but it's like, it's a distracting element, you know? And I think because of the sensory input that's happening, you can lose some, you know, depends on the individual cause, but many people can lose that 
understanding and that sense of connection, which is quite, you know, you need to just focus on. We don't need to, but it can happen. And of course, I think sexuality, the energies involved, I think can sort of inspire a kind of connection between people innately that feels good. And I think there's a reason, you know, there's sort of innate rewards, you know, sort of innately within that. But in my understanding, the deep rewards and the deep meaning of orgasm and connection, you know, it's like it's like a huge big rubber hole, right? And I think, um, you know, this ties back into the rights perspective of orgasm, which I'm not going to go into. But, yeah, basically, um, I think around, uh, yeah, 210, I thought, mm, I've got to give this a name, right? This was something that I was doing. And, yeah, having these kind of interesting reference experiences and, you know, I wrote an article about it and made a little website and, and I called it Mebby. And since then, to be honest, I haven't really known what to do with it. You know, it's one of these things which is like, how would it be marketed? What would the workshop be like? You know, people really interested. Do they see the reason and value of it? Do they think they were already got it down? You know, I haven't really explored it, but I think... It's a very interesting, um, there's a lot of ideas here and that's why I've talked about these people because these ideas came from these people. They didn't come from me. They came from their work, their observation. And, uh, you know, I just started doing this and eventually I had to give it a name and, you know, it became something that I found to be powerfully healing, you know, as I think the core, one of the core issues in the human being is alienation, isolation. What's that? Is it Go- Goitier? Goitier? He's got that. How, how does that song go? It's like. What's that? Oh, not that one. Not that one. It's like, I know it sounds strange, but I feel like I just want to connect. I'm paraphrasing the lyrics. Do you know that one? No, it's a different song. And he's kind of wailing about, you know, not feeling connection. And I think, you know, we live in this paradigm somehow, this sick paradigm that somehow equates connection with physicality. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, a handshake or... You know, a hug or sex does not equate any kind of connection. You know, you can have a connection with someone across the room, you know, that's much deeper. Or even on the other side of the world that you've never met, you know. And I think, you know, that speaks to us of the mysterious nature of these mechanisms of the soul and how the soul wants to relate. So I think in the framework of the therapeutic model, I haven't, I think that say, you know, introducing maybe into MDMA therapy is maybe a bit much, like, you know, I've I've done it once uh, with a client and had someone else, like, you know, a male, like me with another thing I'm not doing myself. And it's like, the issue with it, I would say, is, um, from my perspective, the issue of it is, again, I think you're actually, you know, you're poking a bull or you're poking a cow. You know, I think that a lot of the time we're living in a society where you know, people want a kind of connection and I think, um, you know, to be a man or a woman who is to start, uh, you know, doing this with other men or women is going to actually, um, you know, you're going to sort of like, it's going to create a connection, you know, it's going to, to hit them quite profoundly, yeah. 
Um, with the menu, is that like silent or do you keep a like conscious dialogue? Yeah, so it's silent. Yeah, I don't really speak. Like you maybe if you're really in the zone, you can speak. If you're really in it, you can speak. But until you're really in it, then you don't need to speak because it doesn't need any movement or anything. You know, you can kind of turn around, you know, every half hour or 20 minutes or whatever like that. But yeah, I think where I really came to was I was like, okay, well, I'm only, you know, really going to do this with partners and it's largely too much to, you know, I'm doing it with men. I haven't found very satisfactory either. And I'm not like necessarily that much into the male-male polarity, you know, good, good, you know, happy for you if you enjoy that polarity, but it's not my thing. So, yeah, generally I find it to me that it's more a, a, a feminine um, polarity is more useful. But I think what we're really at culturally is like there's no, there's no ontological foundation for this. There's no spiritual foundation for this. And I would say that, you know, we're really... We've really, as a culture, got to sort of step up and understand how it is to create the rituals whereby we empower one another to realise who we really are, you know. And I think maybe in traditional cultures you had the, I know in some cultures they had the, like the temple prostitute, for example, who was a woman like truly awakened into her sexuality who would be recognised as a holy woman who would be awakening men into their masculinity through, you know, engagement of uh, sexual intercourse as, as a communication of the soul, as a communication of the spirit. So I think, you know, in our society, you know, that kind of woman would be roundly castigated and would be, you know, there, there's not necessarily the ritual or the place for her to exist, and which she would be generally roundly condemned in our society. Yeah. I feel like you're describing some things in the BDSM community, which does have a little bit of a framework. Mm, mm. Oh, yes, yes, I have. I have been to BDSM clubs, and you know, not like maybe a few times, and I know people involved in that community and talk to them at some length about the kind of rituals and. And the language that they use to, to communicate to each other a place of safety and, you know, just trust and security in how they actually do what they do. Uh, I think that's there. And there's the whole Shabari thing as well. You know, that's a bit of a big sort of scene, you know. But that's, you know, not necessarily of interest to me per se. But I think, you know, the... The, the Western psyche, and I think this is very much understated or under-recognised, that in the Western psyche we had, um, you know, pretty much, or, you know, one and a half. You know, we, we had like 1,500 years of Catholic guilt and shame, right? You know, sex is just the flesh. It's, you know, you, you, you're guilty, you're a sinner, right? None of this is, of course, in the, in, in the New Testament um, um, books. But I think it's, it's something that I think has left a profound imprint, psychological imprint. And I think a lot of people are still under the sway of guilt and shame and uh, repression. And I think we're seeing... You know, I think a lot of people have observed in a post-Me Too era, you know, men are especially, you know, kind of shrunk back a lot, you know. And I think there's been a kind of a... I think there's kind of been a sort of a wokest um, ideology that arises out of that, you know, arises out of that guilt and shame, you know. Of course, I, mean, I don't want to get too bogged up in cultural wars <laughs> and like this kind of politic but I think it's very interesting the main point I want to make is that you know this guilt and this shame and this idea that sex is just physical is, a, is, is not the truth it's actually a, you know it's obviously a, a you know satanic plot you know it's obviously that 
the, 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 it's actually obviously wrong. Uh, and, and actually, you know, through sexuality, if it's not within just the framework of, if it's in the framework and the ritual understanding that it is a way to realise the self and the other and to, you know, engage in contact with the divine, the masculine, the feminine, the yin and yang and engage in that ritual. And, of course, you know, there's many, many people who, you know, you can read people like the works of Barry Long, for example, who goes into this a lot. Many people talk about this. You know, David did, and I'm not a big fan. Heaps of stuff, heaps of stuff. But um, essentially, I think it's, it's, it's so interesting culturally that this, you know, where a lot, a lot of people are still under the sway of this guilt and shame and this ideology of physicality. And if we maintain this idea of physicality, we're locked, we're prisoners of materialism. You know, so I think this... This, you know, nascent ritual, which is very easy to go into, you know, me- essentially meditating with another human being, connecting with them in stillness, in that space, you can realise, you know, the, the technology of the soul, which is in that framework of which the technology is... The technology, the, techn- the technology of the organism is very much rela- is very intricate and related to connection and um, communication. And in that communication, um, you know, the two become one. And I think that's the truth. That un- when that when that duality is dissolved and when unity is achieved, that's when there's a big, you know, big thumbs up, big golden tick. You know, we've actually, we've come into, we've had a kind of samadhi experience. And, you know, the traditional idea of samadhi is like, okay, you know, you're meditating and then you, 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 you know, dissolve into light and you become into, uh, uh, in unity. In, you can do that with your partner as well. And if you're not doing it, why aren't you doing it? You know, you should be. Um, yeah. So, John, so when, say, you're with your partner and you say, I have an Indian experience together, you're lying on the side and you are, are dropping in, I guess, to that point where um, you did sex so I say, you go through that. And there's a lot of, I guess, realisation or unity or expression of emotions that you feel are a benefit to you, also to the other person that you're doing this with. How does that then No, well, it shouldn't, really. I think it should, it really should bring about, because it it is intimacy and it should bring about a close intimacy. I think the problem in our world today is people aren't, couples aren't really connecting, women aren't really having orgasms, and so couples aren't really staying together because they're not energetically bonding. And I think the energy, if you don't have the energetic bonding, how are you supposed to stay together, you know? Uh, we just have people bouncing off one another. They're very pneumatic, you know. <laughs> that's that's the paradigm we're living in. That's the lie that porn propagates, and that's these are all the the young kids, you know. Um, these days, that's where they learn what sex is, right? And that's this is like a satanic lie that like it's it's bouncy world. It's not, you know. And that's 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 keeping us atomized, keeping us separate. Um, so yeah, really. It should be, it should be um, uh, very deeply bonding. You know, like I said, you can experience the agony as well as the ecstasy. So it's like a shared experience, and it should be, you should be pretty much experiencing the same type, same thing at the same time as your partner. You know, so you're having a shared experience. It doesn't. I think like whenever you go into a deeply intimate space, you can bring up stuff. Like you know, it can. You know, it can bring up childhood wounds and you can have all kinds of emotional issues come up and, 
you know, it, could probably, it probably just amplifies. I don't think probably amplifies it. It does kind of amplify and uh, the relationship in a sense, you know, because you, you actually, I think it's, uh, you know, more, you know, and I'm not saying this is the thing. People are already deeply bonding and connecting and they're already doing this, right? This is no news to people who are deeply into Tantra or, you know, many people, many couples, they've developed their own secret language, their own secret rituals. They've listened to themselves deeply enough in their own bodies to know how to be intimate, know how to connect. And not everyone gets that opportunity. Not everyone meets someone who they really want to do that with. Not everyone... You know, it's um, not not everyone finds that resonance either, you know, or, or, or discovers that resonance. So, yeah, I think it's a complex, it's a complex question. But, yeah, I think it can be that the more deeply you connect, that it can bring up stuff, you know. It can, it can uh, amplify whatever is there, um, you know. So if you're not ready for that to do the work, it can be quite intense. I'd say. Um, I understand that the whole tank behind it is things to do with your couple, to do with your partner. But can you apply that technique to, let's say, a friend or family member, but not in the sense of sensuality or sexuality, just like connection? Okay, this is, this is the thing. Once you are doing, once you are actually connecting with your partner, um, in uh, you know a face to face, physical closeness, you'll understand more deeply what energetic connection is, and it doesn't need to happen in any you know. Just it's easier to do right next to someone, but once you know, once you develop the toolkit within yourself, you're more able, hopefully, to connect with other people, and also choose not to as well. What's that? Exactly, exactly. And that's, we always come back to Willem Reich and Barbara and Brendan and what their big thing was that people are very much defended. We live in this, you know, very, we've got these hardened shells where we're actually defending ourselves from being vulnerable and open with one another. And, you know, and you start to be able to, you know, you can, you can actually help people to be more open to you if that is the, the, you know, that's your tendency, you know, that's your tendency. And then, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, and then the, the energy of being in proximity, I mean, many people will have this experience or have had this experience of, you know, having a transcendental, transcendental experience of energetic connection with someone who they feel a deep connection with. I think that's fairly, that's something that, you know, happens in, for a lot of people, you know, that's something that is, um, that a lot of people have a reference experience of, of having an experience of an energetic, a deeply felt sense of connection and the person is, you know, quite some distance away. So actually proximity doesn't really make a difference, but yeah, there is that, you know, once you become aware of this armoring, what, you know, Reich would do is body work to remove the armor and become more vulnerable, become more open, if that's your desire. But also there's a reason why we have this armor up. You know, there's a reason, there's a, you know, there's a reason why people are so defended. You know, and often how we treat each other in our society, you know, is is often not not quite um, not quite fair, or it can be can be quite harsh. You know, so I think uh, you know we all we all you know experience being thrown under the bus in various ways fairly regularly in this society. I think you know, so um, yeah. But then, you know, once you become aware of these psychodynamics, you can actually initiate a, 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 a deeper connection with anyone if that's, uh, that's... And it generally happens through communication, you know, in words and vulnerability and honesty and, 
and all that sort of thing that, that, that really catalyzes this sort of thing. Yeah. It, that's just how it started. And then, you know, like, yeah, for sure, you know, any psychedelic, well, especially, you know, mushrooms are very good, will tend to amplify these levels of reality. You know, ayahuasca tend to be a bit involved. Mushrooms are probably really quite good for that. Um, <laughs> I don't know about contraindications. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know about that. But I think, like I said before, I've learned to be very circumspect about who I connect and relate to um, because, um, you know, people are not used to it. They have a reference experience and they can, you know, it's like we can easily catalyze a state in them where they try to attach or you know, create you as a love object or whatever, you know, which is not necessarily good for them um, to do that, you know. So I think that's where any, you know, that's where this is a kind of a fraught space, I'd say. Yeah, that's why it's better to be very careful about who you, who you connect with in general at all times. <laughs> Beautiful shared with my wife, and to get onto that beautiful connective space, you become like uh, quite childlike, quite beautiful, and connecting in quite a profound way. I really enjoy the mm. experience of connecting. Mm. Alrighty, so I'm going to move on to my last neologism. If you don't know, a neologism is a word that um, is a word that is invented, and um, I actually learnt this technique um, from the walk-ins and the walk-ins are these <laughs> beings who take over uh, someone's body who they might not be doing quite so well in their physical life and so this you know 88 dimensional being takes over their body cuts them a deal and they transition onto the astral plane and suddenly um, you know, Joe, the unemployed Darrow, becomes Zarkon from the 88 dimension, you know, and, and, and starts doing a spiritual teacher. So this is a real phenomenon that happened in the 80s especially. And all these walk, walk-ins um, converged in Sedona and started teaching and sharing. And it was randomly in year 2000 sometime, and my friend was playing his wife's, uh, ex-wife's, tapes of the walk-ins. And they talked about a technique called boogie busting, which is to use sound to kill uh, fifth dimensional entities. And uh, so I heard this and I thought, oh, okay, well, I don't know what the fifth dimensional, I don't quite know what that is. And the sound sort of went boom, 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 like that. And I thought, oh, okay. So I kind of, you know, remembered that. And then, uh, yeah, one day I, uh, I was in an ayahuasca group and I killed a spider and I remembered the sound and I went, bah! And I went bah! Bah! and I did it a few times and it was very satisfying watching the spider melt and die. That would have been in 213. So since then I've done a lot of this uh, and I think yeah, it's at 2.16 and I gave it the name Torping. It's just a sound that I made. Eventually I had to give it a name. And uh, yeah, since then I've taken this quite far um, and I'm able to uh, do torping over people's bodies and clear them of entities and I can do remotely as well. Uh, I've had some success with especially people who have some kind of um, interference of entities and they have an infestation of these etheric parasites and I'm able to clear them from the body and uh, you know a lot of people have crazy pain in their body and they have you know cluster headaches and stomach pains and anxiety and you know we have these words like anxiety and, you know, for me, I say anxiety, a lot of the time anxiety represents the presence of entities because what are you anxious about? 
Sure, there's a lot of stuff to be anxious about in our society, but what's the really solid thing that you're anxious about, right? So um, I would say that a lot of times people are anxious because their, their body is telling them, hey, there's trouble, there's trouble here, you know, and wake up, look at this, and they're not necessarily able to register in the conscious mind what it is that their body's picking up. And I think, um, yeah, I think that's a lot of what anxiousness is. And, you know, um, uh, cluster headaches, which are these headaches which come, they come and go, but they come like clockwork on certain times of the day. I see that as, you know, entity interference. I think this is, I think, I think we live in a time that people, are, you know, especially with, you know, more and more use of psychedelics, People are becoming more aware of the issues involved, you know, in the psychedelic space in Australia. I think there's been a fairly decent conversation about these entities that people experience for at least a decade. You know, there's been a discussion at conferences and talk about these entities and their influence on us. And, you know, it's not just in the psychedelic space, but it's in the everyday space, you know, these entities, they don't just inhabit our bodies, they actually predate on us while we're, you know, out in the world. They influence, they influence our world on so many levels. And Do you have evidence for that? Well, yeah, I think that um, all, most traditional societies have a perspective where they have, they understand that there is a, um, you know, in the Middle East they have the jinn, you know, in the Western uh, perspective, they have demons, you know. There's, there's, there's mental hospitals in Brazil called the Spirit, they're from the, the Spiritist Church. There's dozens and dozens of these mental hospitals. And the nurses and doctors, before a patient will come in, they practice exorcism or dispossession on them to clear them because they see that the mental illness is largely a possession. So... You know, I've started to be able to do sort of exorcisms with people. Um, you know, we might even do one here. We might as well give it a go and you, can, you guys can see um, what it's like. But I just want to talk about it a little bit more. So, yeah, basically, it's a sound. Um, it's an intent. Um, I, I have the ability, I'm not sure everyone has this ability, but to do quite a high-pitched sound like this. So I'm creating like a bullet and it, with intent and focus on the entity, I can destroy it. And more intelligent ones, I can tell them to go and they'll get it. Most of them are not very intelligent. They're pretty dumb and they often won't, you know, I can't be bothered, you know, trying to, you know, tell them, um, you know, to, 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 to get them to understand that they're going to die. So... <laughs> So, yeah, but it works. Um, you know, there's, there's different... If you're taking psychedelics and you come across something nefarious, that's, you know, a good way to clear the, the entities. You know, I do this machine gun torping, which is like... <laughs> like that, so it's really... Um, yeah, that's how you can really... We can really get them if you're doing that. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just get attacked in my daily life sometimes. You know, less and less I actually get attacked. But, yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, you walk around our society and it's quite easy to just feel bad, feel drained, got a headache, and you don't even know why. And you you're actually are being drained and you you're actually are being attacked. And so I think, you know... Really, the, the best way to investigate this is to be self-aware. You know, it's like the movie They Live, put on the glasses and you can see, uh, you know, and psychedelics represent those glasses so you can actually take the psychedelics and see for yourself. So the basis of science is actually people looking through the microscope, people looking through the telescope 
and they are actually, they're all seeing the same thing. That's the basis of science, is the observation. And that's, and that, you know, in the beginning, the people would look at the different planets and they'd be like, oh, you're seeing that planet too. All right, you know, we, we, in this situation, you can do your own observation, use the tool, which is psychedelic, and you can come to the same conclusion. Pretty much everyone who goes down this rabbit hole, does it for 5, 10, 20 years, all come to the same conclusion. Say in the Amazon, it's like, it's not like you say to them, no, spirits are not real. They just laugh at you. They just think you're deluded. You're mad. You're out of contact with reality. So, whereas now, our backwards paradigm, it's like, no, you're mad if you think these monsters are real, right? But that's the backwardness of our world. Actually, being in contact with reality is actually seeing the malevolence, being in contact with the malevolence. And, you know, it's not easy to see. It's not easy to see, and we're in a way programmed to look away. And where, you know, it's like the devil's greatest trick is um, that we don't, that we don't see him. Does anyone here have any, like, issue with migraines or headaches or disassociation or anything like that? Yeah, what do you have? Well, I have, um, I have um, very challenging leg problems and my legs just move for no reason. Okay. Okay. All right. Maybe what we can do. Are you open to doing something on the spot? Yes. Yep. All right. Let's do that. Um, what we'll do is we'll just. Um, Sharon, can you bring it a chair? Can we get some sort of chair? Exercise that I'm going to leave you all with that we can all do. It's going to take going to take about five minutes. I learned it from the great American comedian Owen Cook. So if you can just close your eyes and visualize yourself as a baby and your vulnerability. And what we're going to do is we're going to go up through the ages. And you're going to, we're going to say the words. Uh, it might sound a little bit American, and because it is, it's like you're going to say, I, when you think of yourself, I love you no matter what. It's like, you know, and like I'm there for you, Bob, no matter what, you know. But it works. It doesn't work. I love you unconditionally. It actually works. So think of yourself as a baby. And let's see if we can all say it at the same time. You ready? So this is strong, this is a powerful exercise. So, so three, two, one. I love you no matter what. Now think of yourself as a one-year-old. And see yourself really vulnerable, you know, growing up. I love you no matter what. See yourself as a two-year-old. You're terrible too, testing boundaries. I love you no matter what. See yourself as a three-year-old. Be yourself as a three-year-old. I love you no matter what. See yourself as a four-year-old. I love you no matter what. See yourself five, standing up. Discovering the world, you verbal. I love you no matter what. See yourself at six. Maybe it's your birthday party. You pull the girl's hair, she pulled yours. I love you no matter what. At seven. 
I love you no matter what. Visualize yourself at eight years old, you're in school, you're writing. I love you no matter what. You're eight years old. Did we do eight already? <laughs> Nine. I love you no matter what. Ten. I love you no matter what. Eleven. I love you no matter what. Twelve. Visualize yourself at twelve. I love you no matter what. Thirteen. Teenage is coming. I love you no matter what. Fourteen. Teenage is kicking in. I love you no matter what. Fifteen, the most difficult year of all things. I love you no matter what. Sixteen. I love you no matter what. Seventeen. I love you no matter what. Eighteen. You're rushing along, becoming yourself. I love you no matter what. Nineteen. I love you no matter what. Twenty. Almost an adult. I love you no matter what. Twenty-one. You made it. You're an adult. I love you no matter what. And then say, I love you with your full name. Okay? Ready? Three, two, one. I love you, Julie Palmer. That's it. So this exercise, very powerful. It's like, you know, it's like we're a Russian doll with, you know, all these ages inside us and with the, the almost pre-verbal ages especially. If we can come to a sense of recognition and connection with our core, almost like the rings in a tree, those very centre core rings, and, you know, say that we approve, we like, we respect, appreciate, acknowledge, have high regard for, you know, give energy to, and have that sense of connection with the, the deep layers of the inner, you know, child, especially through the, through the age, and if you do this on MDMA, it's even stronger, it's even better. And it's probably worth doing like two or three times. And you do it to the age that you're at now. And just um, the result was similar to when I first took peyote. It seemed to really, you know, ha- have a sense of compression in my soul. You know, my soul felt this sense of being held or, you know, the internal gravity of the self was optimised, you know, and I think maybe you could say that's what love is, a kind of gravity, like a natural force of the self, you know, recognising itself, being itself. And so this is an exercise in recognising your own essence and seeing yourself and appreciating yourself, you know, coming to that. And that's how you're really going to much more fruitfulness into your life. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.